Good morning. It is the 15th of November, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. And we welcome you to this opportunity to join with the St. George's Parish family as together we worship God. So, Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Transforming God, you take the night and give us day. You take our strife and give us peace. You take our sadness and give us joy. You take our fear and give us courage. You take death and give us new life. You give grace beyond all expectation. You give love beyond all imagination. You give and you give and you give. And so we praise and adore you as Creator, Christ and Holy Spirit, one God, three in one, now and forever. Amen. And now, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, as together we say, Compassionate and loving God, we confess we have not always lived faithfully, we fill our days with things that do not matter. We seek simple answers to complex issues. We are weighed down by many tasks, yet we cannot sort out our priorities. We fail to hear your call on our lives. Hear our silent confession and forgive us, merciful God, in Jesus' name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And now the collect for this day. O God, from whose abundance all gifts and skills are lavishly bestowed, Give us courage to use our talents as generously as you have given them, so that, being faithful to your purpose, we may share in your glory, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Judges. The Israelites again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So the Lord sold him into the hand of King Jabin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hagoim. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron and had oppressed the Israelites cruelly for 20 years. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take position on Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the Wadi Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hands. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Now we say the song of Mary. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For, For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He, he has, has scattered, scattered the proud in their, their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy. The, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Matthew. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents but the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed, so I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you? that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and on my return, I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the 10 talents. For to all those who have, more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, Throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I suspect that's a that of all, of all of the parables that Jesus spoke, this particular one is the most confused and probably the most abused. And, and that comes in part, I think, because of our propensity to take things out of context. And when we do that, uh, all too often, this is, is portrayed as like a stewardship sermon by Jesus to future congregations struggling to make budgets, or even worse, as a portrayal of life as a kind of long, long course leading up to a final exam where if you pass, you go to glory, and if you fail, you go to hell. And I, I would suggest that this parable isn't about either of those things. I think if we're gonna understand what Jesus is saying, we gotta put this in context. We have to put it in terms of the context of the unique history of the people of Israel. 
We have to put it in the context of the totality of the life and ministry of Jesus, and in particular, in terms of Matthew's portrayal of that life and ministry of Jesus. See, we, we know that Jesus burst onto the scene in Galilee like a flaming comet in an otherwise dark night. The people of Israel, they, they were living under the dark shadows of the oppression of Rome. And, and they were no strangers to suffering. They were no strangers to exploitation. They were no strangers to violent death. And yet, Jesus appeared in their midst proclaiming the kingdom of God and saying to them, listen, in spite of what you see around you, in spite of all of this stuff that you're enduring, God is present. And because God is present, this is going to change. This is going to change. Matthew portrays Jesus in his life and ministry as another Moses. And he portrays Jesus' mission as a new exodus. See, just, just as Moses came to the world to set free a broken people enslaved in Egypt, so Jesus came to seek the least and the lost, the broken and the marginalized, and to set them free, to give them hope. And, and, and time and time again, he, he invited them to follow him, to join his kingdom movement, and, and to go with him to the promised land. But, but for Jesus, the promised land was not a new place to live, it was a new way of living. Um, and, and time and time again, we witness in Matthew's gospel, Jesus having confrontations with, Jesus attacking the rich, the powerful, the priests, the elites in, in Jerusalem. Uh, we, we heard him say just a few weeks ago that the tax collectors and, and the prostitutes, those who were pretty low on the social scale, they were going to get into the kingdom of heaven before the power brokers in Jerusalem. We heard them, warned them that their position, their power, their wealth was, was not going to give them special privilege in the kingdom of God. And in the last two chapters before our reading today, Jesus warns them again and again, drawing on images from Isaiah and, and from Daniel, he warns them of a coming convulsive change in society, a convulsive change that is going to be marked by suffering and hardship, and that will be consummated in the destruction of the holy city of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Now, now you need to remember that, that the words that came out of Jesus' lips, they were addressed to his contemporaries. The words that came out of Matthew's pen, they were addressed to people who had lived through that convulsive change people who had lost family and friends, people who had endured incredible hardship at the hands of Rome, people who had witnessed the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, people whose whole world had been stood on its head and they were just trying to get by. That's the context. That's the context of this story. So... With that being the case, what, what's going on here? Uh, I like N.T. Wright's take on this. For me, in terms of the literary and historic context, it, make, it just makes the most sense. And, and he suggests that for those who heard Jesus speak and for those who Matthew was writing for, they would have, without question, understood that Jesus was talking about God and God's relationship with the people of Israel. He wasn't talking about money. He, he, this is not about economics. 
This is about relationship, the relationship between God and God's people. And, and Wright focuses on the third servant, the one who buried his talents. And he suggests that, that this servant, this wicked servant, if you will, represents the scribes and the Pharisees, the chief priests and the elders. See, they had been given two gifts. They had been given the Torah, Yahweh's instructions on how to live and how to love, how to build a nation that could change the world. And they had been given the temple, the temple which was to be the sign of God's presence in the world, the temple which was to be the place that so exemplified justice and peace and freedom and love that all nations would be drawn to it. But by the way they lived, because they did not care for the widow and the orphan and for the immigrants, because they actually were part of the exploitive process in their collusion with Rome. They had, in fact, buried these great gifts of Torah and temple. They had not been a light for the world. They had not listened to Jesus' warnings. They had not embraced Jesus' message about the kingdom of God. And, and the message about weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, that is Jesus' warning about a future devastation that could have been avoided. Now the other two servants, who are they? Wright suggests that they were those who heard Jesus preaching and teaching about the kingdom and responded to it. They were the ones who embraced the kingdom movement. They were the ones who would be the mustard seed that grew into a great tree that provided shelter for the vulnerable. They were the ones who would be symbols of God's presence. They were the ones who would give hope for the world. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful interpretation of this parable. It made sense to Jesus' hearers. It made sense to Matthew's readers. It was a message of warning, a message of challenge, and a message of hope. But, but what about us? What about us? I, I would suggest to you that you and I we live in a world which is caught up in convulsive social change. We live in a world which has been and continues to be stood on its head. And as church, as followers of Jesus, we, we have been given two gifts. We have been given the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and we have been given the church, a community, a people whose purpose is to bring light into the darkness of the world, a people whose purpose is to bring healing and hope. And we've got choices, I would suggest to you. We can be that light. We can be that mustard seed that grows into a great bush that gives shade and shelter to the vulnerable or we can bury the gifts by our action or our inaction. We can bury the good news so that it has no impact on those who desperately need to hear it. The choice is ours, the choice is ours. And, and we need to know that, that Jesus' message today didn't end with a warning about weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He went on to say, listen, listen, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And then he will say, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. 
I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and, and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. For Jesus, what matters is not whether we stand up, sit, or kneel when we pray. It does not matter whether we use prayer books or projection screens in our church. It is not about baptism. It is not about so many of the things which we hold up to identify us as being the right church or the right place. None of that matters. What matters is did we feed the hungry? Did we give drink to the thirsty? Did we welcome the stranger? Did we visit those who were needed? Did we take the gifts that Jesus has given us and use them to bring hope to a world which desperately needs it? Choice is ours. Choice is ours. And I believe the world is waiting for us to decide just what we're going to do with those gifts. Amen. And now we respond to God's word as together we say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. We thank you, God of all life and each life, that you are with us every day in each challenge and opportunity. In our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light on the journey. In our questions, you are wisdom for our choices. Stay with us in these days when so much seems uncertain 
and help us to serve you faithfully when and as we are able. God of the Church, we pray for our Diocese of Huron, for Todd, our Bishop, and for all bishops and clergy. Give them wisdom and patience, strength and vision, as the Church struggles to be the Church in these challenging and unusual times. Be with those who feel cut off from their parish communities and those who feel cut off from their sacramental life. Give them comfort and peace in the knowledge that they are never cut off from your loving care. Be with the selection committee here at St. George's as they continue their search for a new priest to lead them into the future you hold for them. Give them the confidence to trust in the leading of your spirit as they go about their work. God of loving kindness, we give you thanks for moments of joy and celebration in our lives, even amidst the ongoing pandemic. For love given and received, for friendships which bring us meaning and happiness, even at a distance, and for family members who show us glimpses of unconditional love. In all our relationships and interactions, keep us mindful of your call to see you in one another. God of the nations, we pray for our country and the countries of this world as we all struggle to face the choices COVID-19 sets before us. Guide those who frame laws and shape policy and those who keep the peace and administer justice. There are so many new challenges to consider and we pray your wisdom will open our leaders' minds and hearts to develop more equitable ways of ordering our communities. God of peace, we remember with sadness the dangerous divisions between nations and the games leaders play to get the better of each other. By your Holy Spirit, move in places torn by war and violence to protect the vulnerable and those who advocate for justice to prevail. Show us how to be peacemakers in troubled times. God of healing, we pray for those who are suffering in these difficult days of pandemic, for those who mourn the loss of someone or something dear. Draw close to all who fear the future. Surround each one with your love and show us how to bring comfort and support into situations of hurt and pain. God of life, you hold all souls in your loving care, the dead as well as the living. We thank you for your saints of every age who continue to inspire us and for all who have meant the world to us and now live with you. Keep us in communion with them and, at the last, bring us all to dwell together in your light. Let us pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Go now and live as children of the light. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Make the most of all God has given you and encourage one another in Christ. And may God's hand be open to you in kindness. May Christ Jesus welcome you into his joy and may the Holy Spirit fill you with courage, vigilance, and faithfulness, now and always. Amen. Amen.